Welcome to the podcast from Morningstar UK, the leading provider of independent investment research. This week, it's ISA Ideas and Budget Week. Let's start with junior ISAs. Junior ISAs allow you to save on behalf of under 18s tax efficiently. Just like an adult ISA, you can choose to shield cash, stocks or investment funds from HMRC. But unlike the adult ISA, investments cannot be cashed in at any time. The child must reach 18 before they have access to funds. We start our podcast today with Emma Wall, Senior Editor for Morningstar.co.uk and Adrian Lowcock, Investment Director for Architas, who discuss junior ISAs in more detail as well as give three fun picks for your junior ISA. Hi Adrian. Hello. So it's our ISA special week this week and we're taking a look at those junior investors today who can invest through the relatively new Junior ISA. So what is a Junior ISA? So a Junior ISA is designed, um, as you guessed, for children. Um, basically from the age of zero to the age of 18, they can put into £4,080 into a Junior ISA this tax year. Um, and the idea is to basically get saving and investing from an early age so that they have a pot of money when they turn 18 that they can use for whatever they want. Buy a car, go to the university, help them buy a house or, or support them when they start a job. And the key thing here is obviously the parent or guardian is investing on behalf of the child. So they make the investment decisions up until 16. But at 18, it really is that child's cash, isn't it? Yeah, and that's very important because at 18 years old, they get the cash. They can uh, they can keep it invested or and it becomes an adult ISA or they can just take the money and do what they see fit with it. So I think education is actually very critical around this. Uh, talking to your children from a very early age about what this is. Actually tell them what the product is and what you want it for them to do. So is it to help them start a job and get or get on the housing ladder? And I think that really helps sort of perhaps minimise or reduce some of that risk that they could just go off and, 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 and spend it on whatever. And the other key thing about it being for the child is the fact that time horizons are different. You may, I indeed, invest my ISA on a shorter term basis than I invest my SIP. But with a junior ISA, potentially you're making 10 to 18 year investment decisions here. So you can afford to take a longer time horizon. Yeah, absolutely. Unlike the adult ISA, you can't take the money out until they're aged 18. So theoretically, they have it, could have it for a minimum of 18 years. And they can actually have it for even longer because they can keep it invested for much longer. But even 18 years or 10 years, as you say, is a long time. And it gives you that focus to perhaps think about things more longer term and then invest for that longer term because that money is going to be tied up one way or another for, for up to 18 years. And with that in mind, what sort of funds should we be looking at or could we be looking at with that longer term horizon for a junior ISA? So I think it's important to, to remember this isn't your money um, and therefore you shouldn't necessarily sort of go all guns blazing and take huge amounts of risk, even though you've got that longer ter- time horizon. So I, I sort of picked a couple of funds that have a an income bias towards them, along with uh, some global growth, also some growth focus on that. So the first one I chose was Fidelity uh, Global Dividend run by Dan Roberts. Now he does target an income on that, but it gives you that global diversification. So this is a good core fund. The income he targets is, is a combination actually. He, he doesn't just target income and not uh, growth, it's a, a sort of capital appreciation with income. So very much uh, looking for companies that have uh, good strong balance sheets uh, and, and, and are able to grow that dividend and that capital over time. I remember to choose the, sh- the accumulation share class and to reinvest those dividends because of course compound interest can double your money in half the time. And that's the power of income is that if you just reinvest those dividends year in year out and you've got say 18 years to do so that can be a very powerful force in in investing so yeah the the accumulation shares would be the right choice here. And what's the second fund? Um, So look playing on a long term theme I picked the Schroeder Asian Income Fund managed by Richard Sennett. Um, Now this is an unconstrained fund but he does have an income focus and because of that income focus he's looking very much at what the dividend yield is compared to the share price. Uh, It's a long-term theme that taps into this Asian uh, trend that we've seen, which is basically uh, sort of growing demographics. They've got very strong young demographics, young population, growing uh, middle classes there. And and, and Asian markets, although the stock markets haven't done necessarily so well in recent years, the the underlying growth is still there. So this is a long-term investment theme and the income is very attractive. And you get that reinvested and you get that compounding again. And of course, with 10, 15, 18 year time horizon, you can afford to stomach a little bit of volatility, which can happen in Asian markets. Yes, absolutely. Uh, So so what we've done here with this fund is actually, because of its income focus and his cautious nature, uh, it it, it actually complements that. It it will protect on the downside anyway, but then you've got the time horizon to sort of uh, of help smooth that out as well. So this should be a sort of smoother run in what is typically a more volatile market. 
And what's the third fund you've picked? So this one is more of a growth orientated one, but and I've gone back to the UK because we are going, we are sterling investors on the whole, and and the, and therefore UK focus does matter. And this is the Franklin UK Smaller Companies Fund. This is run by Richard Bullis and Paul Spencer. Now they take a three pronged approach to investing in smaller companies. They've got this sort of core uh, growth area, which has a, a, a sort of good visible income, uh, uh, income generation from the company, so good cash flow. And then they complement that core with uh, unloved, um, undervalued companies uh, where the growth perhaps isn't fully recognised by the market. And then also the third prong, which is basically these recovery stocks. Um, they tend to be a bit more cyclical in nature. And because it's smaller companies, you need that long-term horizon to really benefit because there can be years where smaller companies really do underperform and, and they can fall 30 40% in really bad times. So you need that long time horizon to really benefit from it. And for people who are setting up their junior ISA today with just less than a month of this tax year left to do so, what are the different ways that you can invest in terms of lump sum versus regular saving? So you, if you're in a situation, particularly coming to the end of the tax year, um, you know, lump sum would probably be the most uh, most effective way to get the benefit of it because you can use the full allowance. Um, but going forward, looking into the new tax year, you can do a regular saving. So you can put a small amount away each month. Um, that can be from as little as £25. It really depends on how much you can afford to put away. Um, the, the pros and cons of both um, are, are by regularly investing, you sort of buy more when the price of shares fall and less when prices are high. Um, with the lump sum, you know, you can effectively just get it done and, and you're com confident that you've used the full allowance. Um, but you can also hold, hold it in cash and wait to wait to sort of drip feed money in like that as well. So it really depends on what you have. If you don't have the cash available today, then regular saving is much more beneficial. But if you have a lump sum, then you can put it away before the end of the tax year. Adrian, thank you very much. Thank you. As the ISA deadline looms, investors should consider their portfolio holistically and aim to have a portfolio that is well positioned to achieve their investment goals. Portfolio Manager for Morningstar Investment Management, Richard Whitehall, is up next to discuss how to take this into consideration when rebalancing your portfolio. As the ISA deadline looms, investors are being bombarded by recommendations to buy top performing stocks, funds or sectors. I would encourage investors not to be swayed and consider their portfolio holistically. Ensure their portfolio is positioned to achieve their investment goals for the long term. There are two issues that I'd highlight for investors that they may be looking at over the next couple of weeks. Firstly, the last 12 months have, have seen stellar returns across asset classes. The FTSE All Share is up 23%, broad global indices are up 36% and even investment grade is up 11%. What that means is that any cash holding that an investor has had has been significantly reduced. Cash is, is not exciting but I think it does have a part to play for most investors in their portfolio, not least as a backstop against capital loss. So now may be a prudent time for investors to add to cash. The second point that I would highlight is that some investors may have had exposure to mining and energy sectors. Well, if so, congratulations, because the mining sector in the UK, for example, has been up 95%. But that does mean that those investments will now be a much higher proportion of an investor's portfolio. So taking money out of those areas or adding it to other parts that have underperformed may be sensible for some investors as the ISA deadline approaches. Chancellor Philip Hammond has delivered his first budget report revealing higher taxes for self-employed and investors with more than £50,000 invested outside an ISA. So what does the budget mean for you? Emma Wall and Sarit Bourbon, Portfolio Manager for Morningstar Investment Management, are up next to discuss just that. Hello, Sarik. Good afternoon, Emma. So Philip Hammond opened with some very positive messaging about UK GDP and the forecasts for growth, didn't he? Yes, that's, that's very true. It's fair to say, you know, he's acknowledged, to give you the stronger backdrop, the UK economy has seen in the last six to 12 months in particular. So we've seen stronger pickup in consumption, which obviously is being reflected in a bit more of an upbeat outlook for the UK. However, worth highlighting uh, this strong uh, consumption backdrop uh, seems to be showing kind of signs of a bit more of a pose. So potential optimism should be actually quite measured in my view. 
And how will that affect investors? What impact will that have on UK equities? So the first thing to remember is that the UK uh, economy is not the UK equity market. So UK equity market is very global in terms of where companies are deriving their revenues and profits. So very important to make the distinction between the economy on the one hand and the UK equity market on the other hand. The second thing to bear in mind, which is key to us as investors, is the price you're paying for those stocks and effectively being quite careful not to overpay for a stream of future cash flows. And our view remains that equities generally are a bit expensive, so are UK equities. So we urge investors to remain quite cautious when they're approaching equity investments at this stage of the cycle. And having a look how the FTSE has reacted to Philip Hammond's speech, there hasn't actually been much movement. We saw banks tick up a little bit, which is in reaction to that economic right. forecast because they do tend to be a proxy for e the economy. I did expect to see some movement in energy stocks because he did talk about potential to help the North Sea, but that hasn't come through yet, has it? Yes, we're just waiting for more detail on what he said about kind of North Sea, some potential relief there. Uh, the oil stocks, the BPs and Shells and probably Tullo, which you would expect to move, haven't moved uh, as far as, as we've seen. You've mentioned the banks, they have moved a bit. That's generally a bit more of a pro-growth trade, so not so much of a surprise. Looking at currency, actually, given a strong growth backdrop, for the UK in the short term, but no reaction there. Sterling still a little bit weak compared to dollar, a trend we've seen in the last couple of weeks, which is a continuation, obviously, of the kind of Brexit phase we started seeing since the middle of last year. Um, there wasn't much in this budget for the investor um, in terms of that, and that's why we haven't seen the FTSE move that much. We saw um, some promises to spend on social care and, and education. That's not really something investors can get access to. There was a little bit of, of um, more details on how he plans to spend the innovation and technology budget that he announced in the autumn statement. But it was really just confirming a lot of what was in that autumn statement, wasn't it? Very true. And I think that's, that's the main thing we should say and to remind people that the main, the main budget, obviously, we know now is going to be uh, in the autumn. And the, the main measures were announced back then, all the measures around the kind of IC allowance, the kind of corporate tax cuts, et cetera, et cetera. So not a surprise that we didn't have too much really to kind of, to kind of discuss in some ways uh, after this uh, statement today. With the one exception, of course, that the self-employed have been rather hit by this budget. They'll see their national insurance rate go up 1% from April 2019 to 10% and up another 1% again a year later. We also saw the dividend allowance for um, for investors and for the self-employed who are pay, paid through direct shareholdings would be reduced from £5,000 a year to £2,000 a year. This doesn't just affect the self-employed, however, because if you have an investment portfolio of £50,000 or more, you will see yourself impacted by this. What measures can investors take to make sure they're not hit by this tax? I mean, I think the kind of key principle is to remain focused on kind of maximizing, maximizing your allowance in terms of ICES and in terms of SIPs. I mean, the rest is to keep your discipline as an investor, and this is very much my role as a portfolio manager, but that's something slightly separate from the investors themselves. So for them, it's really focusing on the allowances that they have. And obviously, uh, the government announced in November that they were raising some allowances for ISA. So this is obviously good news. Investors should look to exploit this. Sarik, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Where do Morningstar professionals invest their ISA cash? Morningstar Investment Management and Morningstar Analysts work with stocks, funds, markets and ETFs every day. But where do these professionals invest for themselves? We asked them where they will be investing their ISA portfolio this tax year. Morningstar Investment Management manage discretionary investment portfolios where Morningstar analysts examine stocks, ETFs, funds and investment trusts all day. Who better than the professionals to share their personal investing stories? Today, we're asking where they have put their ISA cash. Where are you investing your ISA portfolio this tax year? So this year, I'm pretty aggressive on the equity front with 80% of the portfolio in domestic EM and international ex-UK equities. And the remaining is in gilt and EM debt. I typically split my ISA investments between absolute return funds and equity funds. In the absolute return space, I've long held the Henderson UK Absolute Return Fund and recently added the Fulcrum Diversified Core Absolute Return Fund to my portfolio. In the equity space, I allocate between global and UK equity funds. In the global space, I have long held the Artemis Global Income Fund and in the UK, I typically invest in the Old Mutual UK Alpha or the MAN GLG Undervalued Assets Funds.
My ISA cash uh, at the moment is uh, invested fully in cash as I'm building a bit of a savings base. But as for my pension, uh, I am uh, more invested into equities, about 60% of my portfolio at the moment. I'm a bit more cautious generally on kind of market valuations in the long run. And the rest is in a bit of cash and alternative strategies like Newton Real Return, for instance. Um, I'm probably going to add to um, some of my existing holdings this year um, in the areas that we're seeing that are good value. So that's emerging market equities and emerging market debt. Um, I might also allocate to some of my absolute return funds. And one fund I like there is the absolute inside EMD fund. So given my profile, I tend to invest fully in equities. Um, a little bit nervous at the moment on equity markets, so it would be more biasing it towards cash and just waiting for the opportunity to go into equities. Okay, well, I invested my um, ISA allowance right at the beginning of the tax year, and at that time I put it all into uh, equity ETFs because I felt that equities were one of the few good um, value asset classes around. Um, I have to say that at this point in time, uh, I've taken some of the money out and just put it into cash because I think equities are now discounting a lot of good, good news, although it's cash within the ISA, so the, the tax shelter remains. As for me, while my SIP is in globally diverse assets, my ISA are in UK equity funds, including Marlborough Special Situations, Evenload Income, Schroeder Recovery and Finsbury Growth and Income. Now it's over to you. You've less than a month until the end of the tax year, so happy ISA investing. Want to legally reduce your tax bill? Tilney's Head of Estate Planning, Ian Dial, tells us how and warns investors to make sure they balance their needs. Hello, Ian. Hi there. So we're going back to basics with estate planning and tax-efficient investing this week. What are the basics of reducing your tax bill and, and estate planning? Well, I suppose the driving principle with estate planning is to try to balance the access that the clients are going to need with uh, their own ass the assets in order to pay for care, maintain the standard of living, uh, whilst at the same time saving tax. And as a general rule, you're trying to find that optimum balance between tax saving on the one hand versus access on the other hand. So. And say I have put a pot aside to, uh, to pay for perhaps any long-term care I may need to sustain that standard of living that I have got used to, and I have some extra money that I'd like to be tax efficient with, what's the first step? That's where it gets more complicated because there's a huge array of options available. Um, but actually, I would say that if you distill it all down, um, there's really only three things you can do about saving tax. The first is to make best use of your allowances and your reliefs. The, bi the big ones there being the nil rate band and the residence nil rate band. And often that's done via the wills. Um, the second thing is to reduce the size of the estate, and that could be spending more money if you're holding back artificially, or it could be you know, giving money away, and that's where trusts can often come in as well to protect that money. Um, and then the third um, area really is to cover what remaining liability there is uh, using life cover, because that's a much more efficient way of paying the, the liability, and it gets around a bit of a cash flow issue on death where tax has to be paid before probate can be granted, before assets can be released, etc. So, And you mentioned reducing your estate there. Presumably that's to do with gifting and looking after generations that are to come. Yeah, I would say one of the simplest methods of saving inheritance tax is to give away, but just to make an outright gift of, of money to your beneficiaries. The difficulty with that is A, knowing how much you can afford to gift, and B, many people are uncomfortable about releasing uh, the control of that money, you know, maybe for just psychological reasons, they're just you know, worried about you know, affordability, but it could also be that they're worried about you know, their, their beneficiaries um, getting divorced or becoming bankrupt, or maybe they're just not good with money. So that's where trusts can come in, because it allows you to give away assets but retain some form of control over those assets. And what are the restrictions towards gifting money? There is a seven-year rule, isn't there? Yeah, generally, if you make a gift, um, it has to, you, you need to live for seven years after making that gift for it to fall outside of your estate. Um, there are certain small exemptions, you know, £3,000 a year you can give to anyone, um, for example. Um, uh, and if you've got excess income, that's quite a useful one. So more income than you can actually spend, um, then provided you make regular gifts, so it's, it can't be a one-off gift, so annually or more frequently, and it doesn't affect your standard of living, that too is exempt. So if you have got more income than you need, rather than let it build up in your estate, you're able to give that away as well. And you mentioned trusts. How easy is it to set up a trust? And are there any restrictions around that? Because 
I imagine some people would be tempted to can retain complete control over a trust, but then that isn't really a gift, is it? No, you've got to be careful. If, if you retain too much control over a trust, um, then it can be seen as a sham. But um, trusts are, uh, can be fairly simple to set up. Um, many life companies have um, yeah, off-the-shelf um, trusts available to use with their products. Um, and most listers, if you're setting up a straightforward discretionary trust, you know, that's a fairly simple, um, um, a simple trust to set up. Um, and then in terms of running the trust from that point onwards, it's as easy or as complicated as you want to make it. You know, if you you know, hold simple assets in the trust, it, it can be fairly simple and cheap. If you want to hold a property portfolio, which needs maintaining and rent collecting, etc., that that becomes much more complicated from a, an administrative and a tax perspective. Now, we've got a new tax year starting in a couple of weeks. We had the budget this week, but they didn't have too many surprises. Mm. But there are some changes coming in in April, aren't there? Yeah. Uh, and probably the biggest one in terms of inheritance tax is the residence nil rate band. So um, if if you cast your mind back, the government was promising a million pound nil rate band at one point in time. Um, that's slowly been watered down, frankly, to what we have now, which is um, a, yeah, on, on the surface a million pounds between a couple. Um, but the way that's made up of is that um, in 2021, you will have your personal nil rate band of 325,000 pounds for husband, 325,000 pounds for wife, that's 650 in total. And then you'll have an additional nil rate band, which starts this April at 100,000 pounds each, but will climb to 175. And if you add two lots of 175, two lots of 325, you magically come up with this million pound figure. The thing that people need to be careful of though, is it's not as generous as it sounds, is that there are rules around it. Um, so, the, the, you can only use it against the residents um, that you, at least part of your estate on death. Um, that um, that's, can't be a rental property, it's got to be so somewhere no where you've lived. Yeah, yeah. correct. Um, and secondly, it has to be what they call closely inherited, which means you've got to leave it to a child, grandchild, stepchild. Um, you Immediate can't, family. Exactly. It can't be nephews and nieces. That's the one that people need to watch out for. And it's also means tested. So if your total estate is worth more than two million pounds, then for every two pounds you're over that figure, you lose a pound of the uh, the residence nil rate band allowance. So you know, for many people, um, they need to be careful that. Uh, um, of assuming that they're going to get that when actually in many cases they won't. Ian, thank you very much. Thank you. If you're looking to reduce your tax bill and boost your portfolio returns, Emma Wall finishes off our podcast today explaining the benefits of ICES and SIPs and outlines some alternative tax efficient investments to consider. Tax efficient investing is not just about reducing your HMRC bill. In fact, it's more to do with boosting the gains with your investments because of course, money that you're not giving the tax man is more money in your pocket, which means that income that gets paid out in dividend or gains or indeed anything that's reinvested, power of compound interest, will boost your investments. There are several legal ways to reduce your tax bill and boost your investments. SIPs, self-invested personal pensions, and ISAs, individual savings accounts, are the most well-known. But there are, of course, other alternative ways. VCTs, venture capital trusts, and EISs, enterprise investment schemes, allow you to invest in smaller companies, which give you tax breaks. There's also alternative investments, such as farmland and woodland. Commercial forestry is capital gains tax, CGT, free. And if you hold those holdings for more than two years, inheritance tax free too. And that's the end of this edition. We hope you enjoyed this programme. From everyone here at Morningstar UK, thanks for listening.